we're going to get started with our first panel entitled A Lost Lady Public Publication Histories, and we have two, two speakers here today. Our first, Juan Carrillo del Saz, is a La Queja Infinite post pre-doctoral fellow, English Studies Department at the University Automa de Barcelona. He has a BA in Translation and Interpreting, an MA in Translation Studies, and a BA and MA in Architecture. Very interesting, interesting. His research interests lie in the fields of literary translation and reception. He is a member of the research groups COS and Textuatit and Trilcat. He is writing a thesis on the early translations and receptions of Willa Cather, Kate Chopin, and Edith Wharton in Spain. Our second panelist, who was not, is Mary Ruth Ryder. This is not Mary Ruth Ryder. This is Tracy. Mary could, could not be with us today. Uh, she is a distinguished professor emerita from South Dakota State University and author of Willa Cather and Classical Myth, as well as numerous articles on Cather in the Willa Cather Review, collections of essays on Cather, and a variety of professional journals. Her recent essay, Growing Pains, The City Behind Cather's Pittsburgh Classroom, was published in Cather Studies 13, which I co-edited and which is available for sale in the bookstore. Uh, terrible plug. <laughs> so uh, to get us started, Juan. Good morning. Um, and thank you to the organizers of this amazing conference. Um, in this talk, I will analyze Una Dama Perdida. That's the 1942 translation of uh, A Lost Lady, published in Mexico by Editorial Nuevo Mundo. Um, to my knowledge, this is the first Cather's, uh, Cather's novel translated into Spanish ever. And I will approach this topic from a transatlantic perspective and more specifically, I will try and answer the following question. What circumstances surrounded the failed attempt to uh, import this text to, into Spain in 1947? So first, I will present um, an overview of the history of uh, translations of Cather's works in Spain from the 40s to our days. Second, and from the perspective of uh, uh, descriptive translation studies, I will discuss two contextual factors that surrounded the translation and ultimately led it to, to, being, uh, to be banned, uh, namely censorship and the Franco dictatorship and the exile of uh, Spanish Republicans in Mexico. And finally, um, I will briefly analyze both um, the English and the, the translated text, um, paying particular attention to some passages that illustrate some general trends uh, regarding translation strategy. So, the first book by Cather to be sold in Spain bookstores was La Muerte Viene Hacia el Arzobispo, and that was an Argentinian translation of Death Comes uh, to the Archbishop. Uh, translated by Horacio Laurora and published by MFT in Buenos Aires in 1944. It was Edasa, a publisher dedicated to introducing Latin American books in Spain, um, that asked for permission to import 300 copies of the book in, the, in 1947. Contrary to a similar attempt, regarding the Mexican translation of A Lost Lady, which uh, I will discuss later in detail, La Muerte Viene Hacia el Arzobispo was authorized for import. Now, the next decade, in the mid-50s, two other novels were translated, authorized, and published. Uh, Mi Antonia, that's the translation of uh, My Antonia, in 1955, and Los Conolos, or Pioneers in 1956. 
both of them published by Luis de Caralt. Luis de Caralt was a Barcelona-based publisher who introduced a number of world-class authors in translation in the country, including American contemporary classics such as Faulkner and Hemingway. His catalog, and most particularly the collection Gigante, in which both Cather's novels were published, was one of the major repositories of foreign literature in translation in Spain at that time. Um, from the mid 50s to 1999, as far as I know, and apart from a few translations imported from Latin America, only one more of Cather's, Cather's novels was translated and published in the country. It was Uno de los Nuestros, the translation of one of ours, included in 1962 by Plaza y Janés in its Pulitzer Prizes collection. It, has, it hasn't been until the last three decades that Cather has uh, established herself as a well-known author in Spain. From the 90s on, her 12 novels, her complete short stories, and even some of her essays have been translated and published. And uh, they have been published by major publishers, such as Cathedra and Alba. But that's a very recent development. And in the last few years, Cather is starting to get well known among the large public as well. Some of her most popular novels are being retranslated now, and some of her books have also been published in Catalan and Galician as well. I won't elaborate today on why Cather's, Cather's works might have been published so late in, in Spain. However, the situation is clearly different. Uh, from other European target contexts, such as Italy, where at least uh, two novels and some short stories had already been translated by the mid-40s, and even more so in France, um, where no less than six, novel six works and even some in-depth uh, critical uh, work uh, had been published by 1947 as you can see uh, on screen. A number of factors must have played a role uh, in Cather's late arrival to Spain, and censorship was uh, certainly among them. Because to talk about books in Spain in 1947, we need to talk about censorship. Until 1938, the publication of books in Spain was, uh, had been regulated by the print law of uh, 1883. That regulation favored self-censorship uh, on the part of publishers and uh, over-official censorship, let's say. In 1938, before the end of the Civil War, the Civil War ended in 1939, uh, um, the Francoist press law was approved, which would regulate censorship until 1966, when a new law was passed. The press and print law. During those three decades, from the 1938 to 1966, um, <coughs> only small changes were applied to this press law. And uh, therefore, at the time when uh, a lost lady was uh, translated and permission was asked for it to be imported, a comprehensive administrative system had already been put in place and every book had to be submitted for an official censorship check. Here you can see, for instance, the censorship report authorizing the publication of La Solterona. That's the translation of Edith Wharton's The Old Maid from February 1947, the very same month when Una Dama Perdida was burnt. Now, Manuel Luis Avellán, the first scholar who was able to access and systema systematically study the files and effects of uh, Francoist mm -hmm. censorship, concluded four aspects that were considered by the censors on books. Sexual morals, political beliefs, indecent or provocative language, and religion. These were general topics addressed during the entire dictatorship. However, it should be noted that the censors' focus uh, shifted slightly 
uh, in accordance with general politics in the country. For instance, in the early 40s, immediately after the Civil War, specific instructions were issued so that no more works by English and French-speaking authors would be published and books by Spanish writers would be preferred instead. Uh, similarly, the works by four Jewish authors, including Stefan Zweig, were banned following a petition by the German Nazi ambassador since the Francoist regime was still an ally of Nazi Germany in 1942. Um, as it became increasingly clear that the Axis powers would eventually lose the World War, and most certainly when they eventu eventually did so, censorship in Spain shifted, shifted, shifted along with the country's international politics. And as concerns about these topics started to vanish, religion and morals became the new central targets for censorship. Thus, when Leon Felipe, the translator of uh, El Ostro uh, when his translation was submitted to censors in February 1947, uh, it's likely that censor had already been instructed to relax on French, British, and American books. And um, after the World War, the regime was eager to present itself as a, mainly as an anti-communist and as a Catholic nation instead. So this shift eventually led Spain to sign the Concordat with the Vatican and the military treaty with the United States in 1953. To summarize, the political context in Spain flipped completely within the space of a few years, and so did the focus of censorship. In 1947, it had already become a trend to start publishing again uh, translated American authors. Um, together with uh, censorship, there is another major topic that needs to be dealt with when talking about literature in post-war Spain, and the exile and the linkages between the country and Latin America. Once the Civil War finished in 1939, most of the Republican intellectuals who hadn't been executed or imprisoned had to go into exile, including major poets and writers uh, such as Antonio Machado, Luis Ternuda, Rosa Chacel, Maria Zambrano, most of them continued writing during the following decades and contributed their texts to the major magazines and publishing houses of the Spanish publishing uh, Spanish speaking world. Uh, at that time mainly based in Argentina and Mexico. From the late 30s to the 50s, due to political, human and economic factors, the book industry in Spain collapsed. Meanwhile, a large number of editorial projects flourished in Buenos Aires and Mexico City. And this in part, thanks to the contribution of these Spanish Republican intellectuals. One of those projects was Nuevo Mundo, founded by Harry Bloch in 1942 in Mexico. Bloch had previously worked in uh, major American publishing houses, including Alfred Knopf, Cather's publisher and friends, as you know, of course. Um, in the mid-40s, Nuevo Mundo published in Spanish a number of political anti-Nazi works by German refugees and uh, also fiction, as you can see in this list of publications of uh, Biblioteca Moderna, the collection that hosted Una Dama Perdida. Most of these books were translated by Spanish Republican exiled intellectuals. And an exiled intellectual was precisely uh, the translator of Una Dama Perdida, Felipe Camino, known by his pseudonym, Leon Felipe. A cosmopolitan poet, Leon Felipe traveled the world, including most of Europe, the Americas, and South Africa for many years, and he's considered a prominent figure in Spain literature in of the early of the 20th century. Although he is mainly famous as a poet, uh, he's a, he was a man of many parts indeed. 
he graduated and worked for some time as a pharmacist. And later on, when he traveled back to Spain shortly after the civil war, uh, the civil war woke out, he collaborated in a number of cultural initiatives with the Republic government. And uh, he went into exile at the end of the war in 1939, first to France, then to Mexico, where he spent most of uh, his life until he died in 1968. During these decades, he was one of the most active intellectuals from the Spanish Republican exile, and he translated uh, relatively on a relatively regular basis um, from the 30s to the 50s. Uh, as a literary translator, he's mainly known in the Spanish literary world as uh, for his version of uh, Walt Whitman and uh, T.S. Eliot, and uh, uh, although he translated poetry mainly, to a lesser extent, he, he also translated novels, as uh, Cather's novel, and drama, including three Shakespearean dramas. Now, with this contextual information in mind, let's have a look at the, the texts themselves and try to determine to what extent the translator or the publisher applied self-censorship to or if there are any instances of official censorship instead. The censorship file of this book has been retrieved from the uh, uh, Archivo General de la Administración in Alcalá de Henares, Madrid. That's the central repository of, uh, cens of uh, censorship files in Spain. Unfortunately, the report for this book uh, was lost, but two other documents have been kept that tell us important information about the, the process. The registered sheet that contains the uh, basic data of the book and the dates of the process and the copy of the book that was submitted by the importer and read by the censor, which contains a number of handwritten points in marks. Apart from this, um, these pencil marks uh, on, the in on the pages of the book, four crosses have been written on the cover, you can see it in on screen, and also on the title page, next to the translator's name and next to the inscription printed and bound in Mexico, most probably due to Leon's, Leon Felipe's role as a supporter of the Republic and the fact that Mexico, as I said before, was at the time a major, uh, well, it, that was a focus where exiled Expan Spanish Republicans, uh, intellectuals, continued their lives and careers from exile. The internal marks appear nine times throughout the book on the pages of, uh, well, on different pages, and systematically underline excerpts uh, dealing more or less overtly with uh, female sexuality. In two cases, when the, the excerpt deemed appropriate uh, consisted of uh, a full page, the corner is folded instead. Comparing the source, the English text, and the target Spanish text, uh, I have found no instances of self-censorship. Uh, as you can see here, for instance, in this uh, fragment in which references, references are made to Mrs. Forrester's body uh, her taking off her rings to heal Neil, who has been injured. Uh, well, all these instances have been translated without suppressions, without attenuations or, the, or other translation strategies mm, that could have been used to conceal the narrator's description of the female body. Similarly, no ideological manipulation can be found in this other paragraph, uh, which is the first reference in the novel to adultery. I have checked all the relevant excerpts in the novel and the translated text mirrors the English text in all the cases. So this is an instance of censorship, not self-censorship, which was also very frequent at the time. Now to sum up, as I stated, uh, well, as stated in the register sheet retreat from the archive, Una Dama Perdida was banned 
in Spain. And although the full report has been lost, and therefore we cannot know the, the exact terms on which the censor based his decision to, to ban the book, it seems clear to me that two factors determine the decision. First, the fact that the book was translated by Leon Felipe, a prominent Republican intellectual, and the foreign nature of the translation, especially taking into account that uh, it came from Mexico, a country ideologically opposed to the Francoist regime at the time. And second, uh, some sensitive topics uh, that are dealt with in the novel, and particularly female sexuality, and more specifically, the fact that Mrs. Forrester commits uh, adultery, but she is not overly socially condemned and manages to live through it. Thank you very much for your attention. just want to make a quick announcement. Um, we are not, uh, for questions, we are not handing out the microphone this year. If you have a question, uh, please, we have uh, Rachel, Rachel in the back um, with note cards and a staff, mem staff members will be walking around with note cards and you can write down your question and at the end of this presentation, we'll, we'll go through them. So, so if you have a question at any time, please raise your hand and they'll be around to give you a card. Thank you. All right, well, um, as JJ said, I am not Mary Ruth Ryder, uh, but I was happy to read her paper for her today. Um, it's a topic that uh, here on the staff is kind of near and dear to us, and I know that Mary Ruth is planning to record her own talk, so if you want to watch her give it with a lot more, um, you know, joie de vivre than I have, you can sure uh, find that on Whova. Uh, so Mary Ruth's paper is titled, Why Not a Second Pulitzer? A Lost Lady Goes Missing. When Cather received the Pulitzer Prize for one of ours in 1923, she was surprised, and at least for a time, delighted, until the attention brought by the prize intruded on her life. The prize, however, did not come to her with full endorsement of her work. The jurors noted that their recommendation was made, quote, without enthusiasm, and that in many respects, the novel was, quote, imperfect. Every story has a backstory, and such comments were likely only part of that backstory for one of ours. By the time for uh, prize consideration in 1924, uh, Cather had published A Lost Lady, perhaps her most perfectly structured novel, and one that demonstrated a redirection of American realism as she defined it in her 1922 essay, The Novel de Nouble. A Lost Lady was undoubtedly a contender for the prize, since Knopf would likely have sent it forward for consideration as the newest work by his prize-winning author. But it did not win. The question then arises, and why not? Like one of ours, it had sold well, but unlike one of ours, it met with almost universal praise from the critics. It was, quote, perfection in her art, they wrote, really fine, a rare thing the first of Cather's novels to be, quote, to be fully uncluttered. One could argue, and reasonably so, that the likelihood of her winning a Pulitzer uh, in a consecutive year was infinitesimally small. After all, she was only the fourth recipient of the prize for the best novel, and the only precedent of a repeat winner was Booth Tarkington in 1919 and 1922. Moreover, the same three men who served on the selection committee for 1923 were back again in 1924. Jefferson B. Fletcher, professor of comparative literature at Columbia, Bliss Perry, former editor of the Atlantic Monthly, and chairholder of American literature at Harvard, and Samuel M. Crothers, a Unitarian minister, essayist, and often requested speaker. A closer look at these men's backgrounds, their statements concerning their own literary preferences and tastes, and their attitudes toward Howellsian realism 
shed some light on the selection process itself. By the time of her writing A Lost Lady, Cather had moved beyond her youthful infatuation with Henry James, whom she once considered, quote, the perfect writer, and had decided that too much detail could be detrimental to her aims as a writer. In the novel Des Moubles, she turned to Dumas' one passion and four walls as her mantra and argued for throwing out the window the excessive furniture that Howellsian realism espoused. One of ours still contained some of that furniture. A lost lady would not. Among the jurors who had judged the first half of one of ours as fine but were troubled by the novel's second half was a strong leaning toward Howell's probability of motive and fidelity to experience, as well as to photographic realism. Professor Fletcher, who chaired the 1923 prize jury for the novel, had a long career at Columbia where he was one of the foremost Dante scholars in the country. His literary leanings were toward Italian Renaissance romances and symbolism. Having distinguished himself in the ambulance service in World War I, he likely was critical of the latter chapters of one of ours, and Marion Forrester would hardly have met the standards of his three blessed ladies of the Divine Comedy. Bliss Perry, American literature professor at Harvard, also sat on the jury and had served as editor of The Atlantic from 1899 to 1909. He professed to, quote, be genuinely American, a novel or poem had to reflect the typical qualities of the American people, democratic, optimistic, idealistic, and fundamentally wholesome. For him, the American novelist par excellence of democratic America was James Fenimore Cooper. What he valued, I like that you're chuckling about that, what he valued most were the old New England writers, though he was certainly, uh, though he was certain that Henry James's reputation, quote, would remain solidest, followed by Howells. And he consistently published James in the Atlantic. He regarded fiction as a vehicle for social propaganda and sought out examples of such fiction for his magazine, at times, quote, knowingly sacrificing the quality and integrity of the literary work that he was publishing. Still, he strove for balance, not excluding fiction solely devoted to Howell's more smiling aspects of life. Under Perry's editorship, The Atlantic, quote, appealed to a new and significantly wider audience. Perry wrote to James that more than half the magazine's circulation is now west of the Mississippi, and there are more subscribers in Wisconsin than in any state except Massachusetts. The third juror, the Reverend Samuel McCord Crothers had, in addition uh, to his ministerial roles, once worked for Houghton Mifflin, the publisher whom Cather had dismissed by 1923. Noted for his satiric wit, Crothers was a crowd-pleasing speaker. In his work, The Gentle Reader, Crothers asserted that the English novel had, quote, reached its highest development with Fielding and Richardson and that readers of novels still craved action to see what was going to happen next, unless we're reading some of our modern realistic studies of character. On this point, he was in agreement with Perry. Perry had claimed that the, quote, inconstant public craving excitement at any price neither knew nor cared what should be the real aim and scope of a novel. Crothers concluded that literature of lasting value was, quote, an accident, and that there ought to be more local color, more plain speaking. In his satire, The Convention of Books, the respectable classics sat at a table by themselves, feeling thrust aside, old and out of place, while the modern novels uh, loiter on the borders of the convention room, looking askance at their elders. The old men had lost their appeal. Like Perry, Crothers knew that the new second and third-rate fiction would succeed because it appealed to a wider and less educated audience. While the literary leanings of the jurors may have colored their decision, other factors also came into play, specifically the parameters set by Joseph Pulitzer himself in defining the award. Originally, the prize was to go to the American novel published within the year that best portrayed, uh, quote, and this is the important part, 
the whole atmosphere of American life, end quote, and, quote, the highest standard of American manners and manhood. But not even one of ours had been evaluated by that standard because in 1917, the president of Columbia University, apparently under his own auspices, changed the wording for the prize. It now would go to the novel portraying the, quote, wholesome atmosphere of American life. Though Columbia's President Butler would later say that his changes were slight and insubstantial, they were not. The alterations stayed in place until 1927 when the original wording of the fiction award, as Pulitzer had set it down in his will, was restored. And by then, the juries had come to realize that wholesome severely limited the choices of their winners. In rebuttal, Butler's secretary, Frank Fackenthal, claimed that the wholesome was just a typo. But <laughs> interestingly, the typo was clearly and consciously made. It was printed in italics. <laughs> President Butler let it go at that. Uh, with an idealistic young, um, I'm sorry, let it go at that. With his idealistic young protagonist from the Midwest, a seeker of something splendid, uh, perhaps through patriotic sacrifice and a stoic spouse in an unfulfilling marriage, surely met the standard of wholesomeness. But while Captain Forrester had lived a courageous, expansive, and visionary life of the pioneer, his spouse Marion, young, beautiful, and trapped in small town life, seeks companionship elsewhere. She surely did not fulfill the wholesomeness expected by the prize committee. Moreover, the pesky wholesome had led to a major scandal when in 1921, Sinclair Lewis's Main Street was selected for the prize by the jury. But their decision was then overturned by the advisory board. Lewis's scathing attack on small town American life and its hypocrisies did not reflect the wholesome atmosphere expected of a novel winner. A debacle ensued when the press learned of the board's action. While President Butler had put into place directives that no jury discussions would be made public, Cather's eligibility for a second prize would hinge on those discussions. Jury members were now wary of having information about the selection process leaked. Fortunately, limited records of these discussions do exist for 1923 and 4. Jurors had, under Pulitzer's design, the discretion to adjust parameters for making the award and even the right to give no prize if, uh, in any given year if the jury felt that all nominees fell below the standard of excellence fixed by the board. No award had been made in 1917, and no award was given in 1920, with no novel said to have met the qualities expected, and while the jury considered nominating Willa Cather for a second time, their fear of the board again overturning their decision must have been substantial. When one of ours was recommended as a winner in 1923, Fletcher, the jury chair, wrote, I might add that this recommendation is made without enthusiasm. The committee, as I understand its feelings, assumes that the trustees of the fund desire that the award should be made each year. In that case, we are of the opinion that Miss Cather's novel, imperfect as we think it in many respects, is yet the most worthwhile of any in the field. When a lost lady was a candidate for the prize, the same jury reported to the board that their final decision was, quote, lacking in conviction, and that in their opinion, quote, there was no book outstanding enough to merit a prize this year, but that if the board deemed that a prize should be awarded anyhow, the committee would name Margaret Wilson's The Able McLaughlins. And they did, under pressure just to give the prize. So the jury recommended for the prize the first novel of a virtually unknown writer, Margaret Wilson, who, like Cather, offered up a story about the pioneers of the plains, in this case, Scotch Presbyterian immigrants to Iowa at the close of the Civil War. The protagonist, Wooly McLaughlin, is the picture of American manners and manhood. He takes upon himself the rescue of and subsequent marriage to a young woman 
who finds herself pregnant as the result of an assault by one of his kin. Never betraying the truth of the situation, Wooly stands by his wife and publicly acknowledges the child as his son. While his noble actions somewhat parallel those of Neil Herbert in his efforts to protect Mrs. Forrester and her reputation from the small-mindedness of Main Street, Wooly has the additional attributes of deep religi <laughs> religiosity uh, that embraces an eye-for-an-eye eye philosophy. He forces the abuser to leave the community for all time, but when the perpetrator does return, ill and dying, Wooly takes the high road. And rather than exacting revenge, he cares for the dying man, takes him back home to his distraught mother, and demonstrates a largesse that was admired by the readers and reviewers alike who were accustomed to historical romance endings and altruistic heroes. The reviewers described the novel as presenting simple but, quote, true people, solid frontier stock. By contrast, Cather's novel showed far less of the descriptive details that readers had come to expect. It was a compact work with complex characters. She had thrown out all the furniture of Howell's realism, and Wilson had retained it. As one critic noted, the best qualities of the Abel McLaughlins are its facts the furniture of pioneer life, descriptions of simple meals, devout prayers, building of homes, the cozy hearth, the poor conditions of roads, end quote. The jury, all of whom critically embraced the importance of, quote, convincing details of ordinary life, would have preferred Wilson's approach. Cather certainly dealt with fidelity to experience and probability of motive, but had stripped down the clutter to absolutely bare essentials. She was doing something new. The prize was not ready, even if some critics were. Bliss Perry had in 1912 declared, no one can understand the present day America if he does not understand the men and women who live beyond the Allegheny Mountains and the Rocky Mountains. Wilson's The Abel McLaughlins offered that understanding. One reviewer described her novel as, quote, animated by the epic motive of the growth of the soil, and situated the novel alongside Cather's earlier prairie novels, including one of ours. But likely in Perry's estimation, Cather had strayed too far from this focus in A Lost Lady. Marion Forrester is not typical of her other prairie sisters, nor is she a Howellsian representative type or James's prototypical American girl, Daisy Miller. Wilson's The Abel McLaughlin's surfaces as a prize nominee partly then by default. The novel is less an in-depth character study than a detailed description of pioneering life. As a former missionary, Wilson also focused on the effects of religion on the individual, as occurs when Woolley, influ influenced by his wife, embraces the Christian thing to do. Neil Herbert, by contrast, comes to the rescue of his lost lady, not because his faith commands him to do so, but because she's a woman that he has long admired and thinks deserves to be rescued, a more romantic ideal than an, a religious one. Wilson's works were also known for relying heavily on coincidence for their resolution, for tying the package up neatly by the novel's close. Cather, on the other hand, leaves readers wondering at the end of A Lost Lady what Neil actually means by his comment, so we may feel sure that she was well cared for to the very end. Thank God for that. The Abel McLaughlin showed Wilson's ability to deal with realistic minutia of frontier life in the 1860s, but suffered from, quote, saturation in material detail the lack of which brought critical praise to Cather's A Lost Lady. Wilson does, however, argue for more community understanding and charity before society's rigidity. In this, she and Cather agree. But unlike Cather, Wilson impales her readers with the moral lesson of redemption and forgiveness. The work exhibits other structural weaknesses as well, chiefly that the characters' motivations are not always sufficiently developed and explained, and her prevailing optimism, though appealing to post-war readers, cost Wilson coherence of plot and conclusions that were more convenient than logical. 
W.J. Stuckey's final evaluation of Wilson's novel hits the mark when he says, it agreeably combines sentimental romance under a glossy patina of realism. Simply put, the Abel McLaughlin's is a formulaic and derivative first novel. Nonetheless, the novel was general, generally warmly received and was republished again in 1925, 1931, and 1977. Some readers even thought the author was the daughter of President Woodrow Wilson. The novel was lauded in print for its strong American appeal, its high moral tone, and its freshness and simplicity, all of which would qualify it as wholesome. The London Times Literary Supplement even used the word in its review. It is a capital story, its characters are wholesome, lovable, well-rounded, and the atmosphere of the whole book breathes of the fresh prairie wind. Heloise Hershey and the Atlantic lauds the novel's conclusion for offering a poignancy to pierce even the hardest heart, leaving one praising the Lord that the Scots have found their home in our land. The Pulitzer jury undoubtedly was also aware that the Abel McLaughlin's was the winner of the 1924 Harper Prize, selected from 739 contenders. In a side note, Harper was also the publisher of this novel. Did the Pulitzer jury find it simply convenient to follow suit and give the novel yet another award? Possibly. In 1924, the jury was still bristling from the board's veto of their choice in 1920. Stuart Pratt Sherman, the jury chair in 1922, had written to the board asking, quote, for assurance that a unanimous verdict of the jury would not be vetoed by an unexplained action of the board. They did not want to be slapped publicly again. Choosing Wilson's work, already a national award winner, would likely not lead to that end, and Cather's work felt more iffy. When they settled on the Abel McLaughlin's, however, there wasn't much cheering. The jury's rejection of a lost lady was perhaps only marginally affected by their concern that she had won the Pulitzer in the preceding year, though we have no record of discussion on that point. When, though, in 1932, Shadows on the Rock became a, quote, principal contender for the prize, the jury noted that Cather had received the 1923 prize and added, this fact, however, was not determining. To this day, the prize for fiction remains the sole prize that has never been awarded to the same person in consecutive years. The total number of submissions for the Pulitzer Prize in 1924 has been lost to history, though it probably exceeded the 739 submitted for the Harper Prize. That the jurors read all novels submitted for both prizes is unlikely, if not impossible. Had they read Cather's? Probably. She was a distinguished figure on the American literary landscape and one they could not ignore. But she had already won once, and here was Wilson, a new woman writer, clearly less skilled but writing of the same region, drawing on its local color, and extolling the beauty of the same prairies, even if not doing so as competently as Cather. And Perry's inconstant public liked the book. They liked her idyllic descriptions. Uh, and there's a long quote from the Abel McLaughlin's. The prairie lay that afternoon as it had lain for centuries of September afternoons, vast as an ocean, motionless as an ocean coaxed into very little ripples by languid breezes silent as an ocean where only very little waves slip back into their element. One might have walked for hours without hearing anything louder than high white clouds casting shadows over the distances or the tall slew grass bending lazily into waves. So Wilson's novel begins. It would have been more appealing to readers' taste than the descriptions early in A Lost Lady of one of those gray towns along the Burlington, a house that, uh, stripped of its vines and denuded of its shrubbery, would probably have been ugly enough, and a cottonwood grove beyond which stretched sweltering marsh meadows with glistening tall weeds and snakes sunning themselves on old stumps. Questions of which work was better, uh, or which work better deserved the prize, what literary biases might have swayed the jurors' decisions and what pressures within the Pulitzer Trust itself affected the outcome cannot be fully or definitively answered. 
History, though, is the true judge. E.K. Brown in 1946 asserted, A Lost Lady is one of the books on which Miss Cather's survival will depend, by which it will be assured. And he was right. The Abel McLaughlin's, on the other hand, has lapsed into obscurity. The prize committee got this one wrong. A Lost Lady is not missing. Thanks. Thank you both so much. Very interesting papers. We'll get some questions here. I'm These are, uh, this is to Juan. Uh, did you say that a lost lady was censored? And if so, which parts? No. Did you hear me? No, it wasn't censored. Um, it was published in Mexico in this uh, publishing house, Nuevo Mundo, in 1942. And then it, there was an attempt to import it into Spain five years later, in uh, 1947. And, um, well, it was banned for, the, it was banned for, for import. But, um, so it wasn't published in the country uh, what I have accessed is the, the copy of the book that the Spanish censor accessed. And there were uh, a number of uh, handwritten marks in pencil on specific fragments of the book, specifically dealing uh, mainly with uh, adultery and female body. Uh, but no, it wasn't actually censored, it was banned in Spain, not in Mexico. Have, have other of, no. of her books been banned in, in Spain? No. Uh, the, 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 the other books uh, uh, published under Francoism in Spain, uh, which I, I showed you before, uh, were uh, the, the, the translations in the 50s of uh, my Antonia and all pioneers, and later on in the 60s, uh, one of ours, all of them were published with uh, no censorship. There was probably self-censorship. I haven't gone in detail to the microtextuality of these uh, novels, but according to the official uh, censorship reports, there was no, uh, no censorship in these cases. Okay, I have another question for Juan. Um, what is Willa Cather's reputation in Spain? <laughs> I don't know if you can speak for the entire country, but uh, <laughs> we're, going, we're going to ask you for that. Well, uh, as I said, uh, she's been very, I mean, she hasn't been really known among the large public for until very recently. Now there is a trend to, to publish uh, uh, American, uh, some American authors, um, Edith Wharton, that, well, the, the authors I uh, study in my, pitch, in my thesis, uh, there is currently a trend to, to publish Edith Wharton, Kate Chopin, uh, Willa Cather, but this is very recent. Uh, throughout the 20th century, Willa Cather was virtually unknown in Spain. She's, of course, uh, uh, I mean, there are, at, at, the, at the university, she's well known as any other uh, American author in the canon, but not until very recently among the large public. Thank you. Why do you think they translated A Lost Lady before the Pulitzer Prize winning novel, One of Ours? 
was World War I too sensitive a topic? What are your, what are your thoughts on that? Good question. Well, that must have probably played a role, but then there is also some randomness in publication histories. And in this particular case, uh, the attempt to import a lost lady into Spain uh, is due to uh, a larger project to, they try to import four or five books, I can't remember exactly, by this uh, publishing house, this Mexican publisher, uh, Nuevo Mundo. So, and well, Gather happened to be included in this, uh, I mean, a lost lady happened to be in this collection. Uh, but I think it's more this, it's a uh, casualty. It's not, there, is, there are no underlying factors in this particular case. Thank you. And um, we have a couple more questions for Juan. Did the poet translate Lost Lady before getting permission in Spain or would have been published in Latin America anyway? Uh, like like the, the, the work by, by the poet, by Leo Felipe. Uh, well, for sure he had been published uh, before the beginning of the dictatorship. And, uh, that's uh, 1939. For, to begin with, he was well. Uh, there was no censorship at the time. He was a prominent, uh, very respected poet. And uh, afterwards, uh, yes, he was censored for for many years. I think until the until the fifties. It's around the fifties that the regime starts to well, accept that some Republican intellectuals can be published again, including, for instance, uh, uh, Machado, but, well, he's a very particular case. Machado is very complex. And then we kind of have a personal question. How, how did you come to know and appreciate Willa? Well, uh, it was uh, at, uh, at college, I mean, at the university. Uh, but we were translating uh, some fragments of uh, my Antonia, and yeah, that's how I discovered. I, I had never read anything before by Willa Cather, and well, I absolutely loved, uh, well, the way he she uh, approaches such complex issues as immigration. I loved her from the very first minute. <laughs> You're not alone, I think, in this room. <laughs> Any further questions for our panelists? Oh, we have a couple more. People are ready. Uh, in terms of Mary's paper, I was just interested. I don't think that a lost lady was even considered for the Pulitzer. When you see the old records, they, they have three finalists, and you can see what, what they're choosing and what are the comments. So as Mary's paper mentioned the previous year, they, uh, they gave it with two of the uh, judges voted yes and they gave it with great reservation. But I don't even think it was considered that year. I don't, I don't know that there's enough of the record because you only get the like short synopsis uh, in, the, in the Hohenberg book um, of what they, you know, maybe a short list, maybe there's five. Um, but I, I mean, I think Mary Ruth's um, basic thesis is probably good. It would, it would seem very unusual if Knopf hadn't put it forward. Um, you know, whether it made the short list or not, right. who knows? Right. No one knows. I think we have one or two more questions. Uh, what is the Pulitzer like now? Same narrowness, more artistic experimentation valued? Uh -huh. <laughs> this is a question from last year. Gosh, I was going to say, uh, we need Maureen Corrigan to come back and talk about that. Um, uh, can you remember, Ashley, do you remember how many books did Maureen Corrigan say she read when she was on the Pulitzer? 
several hundred books. And yeah, a lot of books. And it's my understanding from talking with Ted Kuzer that you know um, the publishers of the books have to pay a small fee and they put it forward and that's how you get nominated for these. Um, that's how the process goes. I think it's still contentious. One of the things I found in the archive recently that was interesting to me was um, a, it was a little press piece, and I assume it was put out by Knopf without Knopf's name on it, and it said, Willa Cather being considered for a Nobel Prize. And it had you know, her photo. Of course, she never won a Nobel Prize, but I always think of um, the, the years when people said Toni Morrison was campaigning for a, a Nobel Prize and thinking about the ways that um, authors and publishers now sort of compete for that. Uh, you know, it's a, it's a business. And I think at, at, the, you know, at the time of The Lost Lady, obviously Knopf saw what happened to Cather's career after she won the Pulitzer Prize. Mm -hmm. There was a reason to go ahead and go for it. I think it only is more so now, more competitive, more cutthroat, more at stake um, with all of those prizes, as James English talked about last year. Mm -hmm. the, the rules aren't as, as strict. The wholesomeness, those, those no, kinds of things have, have, been, have been done away with. the wholesome part is gone for sure. <laughs> Um, and uh, for one, can you discuss the art of translating? <laughs> Good afternoon. Pa particularly, how to capture Cather's unique American tone. How do you engage her voice? <laughs> I can't answer this. I mean, I would need uh, three, four years to prepare that. Um, uh, a week to answer, I know, I can't answer. <laughs> I mean, uh, I think Leon Felipe did a very good translation. If uh, whoever asked these questions, uh, this question uh, speaks Spanish, uh, and, and you can find the, this book because it's not, um, it's very difficult to find, uh, I recommend. I recommend it, it's a very good uh, translation. But yeah, considering how different English and Spanish are, and how particular is Cather's writing, yeah, it's completely. <laughs> <laughs> and with that mic drop, we will conclude our first, our first panel this morning. Thank you all for attending, thanks for your questions. Thanks to our panelists.